Hi, I'm Father Cedric Pizania. We have a reading for the fifth week of Lent that comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Among those who went to worship at the feast were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew went with Philip, and they told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it just remains a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. We are now coming toward Holy Week, and Jesus is speaking about suffering, the grain of wheat dying and bearing fruit. And so now the emphasis of Lent is shifting toward our sufferings and the meaning of suffering whether it be going through cancer, having sciatica, having to face life in a wheelchair, going through a divorce, having an addiction, sufferings abound. And I want to proclaim, and this is where we're trending toward Lent right now, sufferings have meaning. The word passion means suffering and sufferings have meaning. Of course, we find redemption, salvation in Christ's sufferings, but our own sufferings have meaning. Viktor Frankl was a man, a Jewish psychologist, who went through great sufferings. He was held in a Nazi concentration camp in Germany, and he was held, I believe, in Auschwitz. When he was released, he wrote a book, and his book was called Man's Search for Meaning. And what he says in this book is this, you can put up with any what if you have a why. In other words, if you have meaning, you can deal with any suffering that you're facing. And there is meaning. There is purpose in the pain. First of all, suffering gets our attention. I remember when I was a young man, I used to be so superficial. And my sufferings deepened me, and I went from the superficial to the supernatural. I remember it was C.S. Lewis. He lost his mother. He was abandoned by his father. C.S. Lewis, of course, the great writer. He had respiratory illness. He lost and he buried his own wife. And this is what C.S. Lewis said after going through all these troubles. He said, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. In other words, pain shouts to us, speaks to us. God speaks to us through our pain. Now, I want to make clear that God doesn't give us the pain, but God uses the pain. And I say this time and time again, God knows how to make all things work to good for those who love him, and God writes straight with crooked lines. Now, I want to tell you more about the meaning of suffering and the purpose of pain, and I want to do this in our chapel in Houston, Texas. I had the privilege of studying philosophy. I spent a whole year in my life studying philosophy, and it's the quest to answer questions, and perhaps you have some questions in your life, such as, what is life? How can I be happy? What is the meaning of my existence? And this is what philosophy tries to decipher. Philosophy, of course, what I learned is that it's the handmaiden to theology. The two go hand in hand. Theology is also about answering questions through the search for God. So these people came to Jesus. They were Greeks. They were philosophers. And when I studied philosophy, I found out that there are many branches of philosophy, the, the sophists, the cynics, the Epicureans, the Stoics. There was Aristotle and Plato and Pythagoras. So there's all these different philosophers, all these different philosophies, all striving to answer different questions. So that's a little bit of the background of these people coming to Jesus. And they were coming and they were saying, you know, we've heard that you're a great teacher. Give us a new philosophy. Give us something that works. We've heard about Plato and Aristotle and all these others, but we want something that will make our life work. And isn't that true in everybody's life? And then Jesus gave them something, and I hope you got this. Jesus gave them a philosophy that was so earth-shattering and so mind-blowing and so novel and so new that they probably missed it and they probably said, what is this? And oftentimes we hear what I just read to you and we don't even get it. 
When the philosophers came to Jesus, Jesus gave them a philosophy, and this is what he said. Unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it just remains a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And really, to me, that is the foundation of Christianity, that philosophy. In Catholicism, we call it the Paschal Mystery, death and resurrection. So he gave that to philosophy to the, to the Greeks, and they were probably shaking their head going, what in the world does that mean? And a lot of people today don't understand what that means, and it really is the great philosophy of Jesus. You know, Aristotle had his philosophy, and Plato, and Pythagoras, and all these different philosophers, the Stoics, the Epicureans, and this was Jesus' philosophy. Unless something dies, it just remains by itself. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So let's break this open. I lived in the Sacramento area, and every once in a while I would go down to Sequoia National Park. And I remember I came upon the largest living thing on earth. It was called the General Sherman Tree. And get this, it was 2,500 years old, 275 feet high, 4 million pounds. And get this, it all came from a little tiny itsy bitsy seed. You see, that seed, when it was planted in the earth, in the darkness, in the pressure, it had explosive growth. And this is what Jesus was talking about. Unless a seed die and become something else, it's just going to remain a seed. But if it dies, it will explode into something new. What a philosophy. I've studied philosophy, as I said. I never heard anything like that from all the philosophers that I ever studied. And now in the gospel, we're hearing this wonderful philosophy that in the darkness, in the pressure, in deaths of our life, explosive growth can occur. That's exactly what I want to happen to you. If you're going through a dark period in your life, if you're going through a hard time in your life, if you're going through pressure in your life, if you feel like you've been buried in your life, you're dying in your life, that is the incubator. <laughs> that is the atmosphere for growth. And that's what Jesus was telling us. That's what Paschal Mystery is. It's death, yes, but it's resurrection. I have many examples of this I'll be sharing with you in this program, but just think about your own life for existence. You grew in your mother's womb in the darkness of your mother's womb. Your mother's womb was the incubator of growth. You began as a little seed that explosively grew in nine months, and then you became a human being. But it all happened in the incubator in the darkness of your mother's womb. And we all go through dark times in our life. And those dark times aren't necessarily times where, that can be lost or uh, put aside in our life. Those are the times sometimes of greatest growth. I think about, for example, Beethoven. You've all heard about Ludwig Beethoven, von Beethoven. Arguably one of the greatest musicians and composers that ever lived. He composed all these different symphonies. He was a very creative man, as you know. Well, the interesting thing is that when Beethoven was 26 years old, he was a composer, he was a pianist, he began to lose his hearing. And a hearing for a musician is everything. He was devastated by the fact that he was going deaf. I call it the darkness of deaf, or the darkness of deafness. And he was devastated, and deep within, he was shattered, and he began to contemplate suicide. And then in time, he realized that, you know what, God had put a gift in him, and he didn't want to lose that gift. He wanted to cultivate that gift. And in the darkness of his deafness, he continued to create. The darkness, actually, his deafness became the incubator, if you will, of something new. And as you know, he continued to compose symphonies, and he composed, finally, the Ninth Symphony with the Ode to Joy while he was deaf. And this was arguably his best symphony. And we all know that song, The Ode to Joy. And it happened in his darkest time. It happened in the midst of his deafness. And we all go through dark times. And I want to tell you that the dark times of your life, as I've said, can be the incubator of something magnificent, a conversion, a growth, a dream realized. And darkness, as I said, 
is a time of great blessing. If you've ever seen a professional photographer, it's interesting how they will develop their photos. You know, they'll take photos at a certain place and, you know, it may be of a wedding or it may be of creation or mountains or the sea or something like that. Then they'll take the negatives, they'll go into a dark room and they'll wash those negatives in a chemical solution. If any light comes into that room, it will spoil the negatives. So in, actu in actuality, in order to develop, we actually need the darkness and then it will develop into a beautiful photograph. And it's the same way in our life. Sometimes in our life, we need the darkness in order to develop. Sometimes the light is taken away from us for a little while for a reason, because sometimes the light will spoil us at wrong times of our life. And we need that darkness in order to develop and become a person of character, a person of integrity, and a person who can live their dreams to the fullest. I think about a dark time that happened in the life of St. Paul of the Cross. St. Paul of the Cross, of course, the founder of the Passionist community. I'm a member of that community. And when he was 19 years old, he had a vision from God. God touched him in a very powerful way. And he felt that God was calling him to found a religious community. And he wanted to call the community the poor of Jesus. So clothed in this black tunic, we call it a habit, he went to the Vatican, he went to St. Peter's, and he wanted an audience with the Pope, Pope Benedict XIV. And when he showed up, he had bare feet, he was dressed in black like this, and he wanted an audience with the Pope. Now, the guards at the time, when they saw this man, they thought he was a vagrant, they thought he was a vagabond, and they threw him out. Can you imagine, here's this man, Paul of the Cross, his name was Paul Danio, 19 years old, has this vision from God to found a religious community, and he's rejected by the church that he loves. I call it the darkness of rejection. And some of you have been rejected by your husband or your wife. You've been rejected by your children. You've been rejected by your parents, by peers. There's probably no greater hurt than to be rejected by people that you love and want to be accepted by and you feel like you don't belong. Can you imagine being rejected by the church that you love? So St. Paul of the Cross, he wasn't a saint then, but Paul Danio, instead of turning to despair, he turned to prayer. It was a very dark time in his life, but he didn't let it hold him down because he knew the, he knew the philosophy of death and resurrection. He went to a basilica, one of the four major basilicas of, in Rome. It was called St. Mary Major. And he went into one of the side chapels. In one of the side chapels was a crucifix. And as he prayed before the crucifix, he realized that Jesus had been rejected. He had been spurned. He went through a dark time. And as he was praying, he sensed God calling him still to found a religious community, but this time a religious community not called the poor of Jesus, but called the passion of Jesus Christ. And he founded, he wanted to found a community called the Congregation of the Passion. About a month later, he went back to the Vatican. Miraculously, he was let in. He had an audience with the Pope. And amazingly, the Pope, when he heard his vision, said, yes, this community should have been the first community founded, and here it is, the last one founded. And we're called the Passionists. Now we minister in 60 countries in the, around the globe, through television, through preaching, through retreat centers, through uh, hospital chaplains, through churches all around the world, all because in the midst of darkness, this man did not give up. Paul of the Cross has been subsequently canonized Saint Paul of the Cross, the founder of the Passionist community. And so this whole philosophy of how darkness can be the incubator of new life. You've all heard about the dark night of the soul. That's by another saint, St. John of the Cross. And the dark night of the soul is that time where we lose the sense of the presence of God, but it always leads to illumination and purification. So there may be a darkness, but then the light comes. And then there's other times in our life that darkness turns into light. For example, in our culture, you've all heard about the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. 
as we grew as a human race. And the Dark Ages were a, were a very hard time for the cultures. But that was followed by the Renaissance. And then that was followed by the Enlightenment. So in other words, the Dark Ages gave birth to uh, a growth in literature, in architecture, in the world economy. It's called the Renaissance. We came up with artists like da Vinci and Michelangelo. St. Peter's Basilica, for example, came to be during the Renaissance. And that followed the Dark Ages. So what I'm simply trying to say is that darkness can be the incubator to something new. You know anything about wine, you only like a wine when it has good taste. Well, in order to mature wine, as you know, what they do is they store wine in a wine cellar. The wine cellar is very chilly or cold, and it's also very dark because if light comes into the wine cellar at the wrong time, it will spoil the wine. The wine will not mature well, and it will lose its taste. In the same way, in order for us to mature and to grow and to develop, in some ways, sometimes we need to be put in the cellar. Sometimes we need those dark times in our life in order to grow and to mature and to develop. And then if the light comes at the wrong time, we'll lose our taste. It's the same in our life. I'm thinking about what I've been through in my life in college. I had a very difficult and dark time. It was similar to St. Paul of the Cross. It was when I was about 19 years old. And I was dating a woman as a freshman in college. And then we had a breakup. And at that breakup, the only way I can put it is, I went through a bottoming out experience. I felt empty. I felt lonely. I felt very hurt. And as I explored my heart, all the philosophy that I learned in life, all the techniques of living wasn't working because I wasn't happy. And I knew that I needed a new philosophy in life. And like the Greeks, I came to Jesus. And I looked at his philosophy because I wasn't happy, my life wasn't working, I had bottomed out, and I needed something new. And as you're watching this program right now, perhaps you're not happy. You're going through a difficult time in your life. Maybe you've bottomed out and you've hit rock bottom. And you need a new philosophy. You need something that will work. You need something that will make you happy. That's why I'm inviting you, come to Jesus. He will help you. Like the Greeks, come to Jesus. He'll teach you something new, and he'll give you something that will work. He'll bring you to eternal life, and he'll give you something that will make you happy. That's exactly what happened in my, in my life. I was going through a darkness. I felt kind of like in a wine cellar. It was dark in there. It was cold. Nothing was happening. And then at the right moment, I came to Jesus. I had bottomed out. And Jesus accepted me just the way I was. And I experienced a rebirth. You see, the Paschal mystery is death and resurrection. Darkness and death is the incubator of explosive growth. And that's exactly what happened my, in my life. I wasn't a very spiritual person. I wasn't very happy. I felt empty. But then, as I came to Jesus, not only did he give me a new philosophy, he poured his spirit into me, and I experienced new life. I had a conversion. And I believe that the incubator of that conversion was death, darkness, a bottoming out. You all know about the Alcoholics Anonymous program, AA, and Gamblers Anonymous, and Overeaters Anonymous, and all these different anonymous programs. Perhaps the foundation of these programs is that a person is journeying in their life and they're living their own philosophy and they're trying to cope with life the best that they can and they have a bottoming out of some sort. They go through a darkness. They go through some kind of a death experience and that leads to an illumination, <laughs> an awakening. And that's usually what happens in a person's life. When you're going through a hard time in your life, be ready because that's usually the time that God's going to work and that the light will come flooding in just at the right moment. If it comes too early, you won't be ready. That illumination needs to come just at the right moment, just like with wine, just like with a negative being developed in a dark room. 
If the light comes too early, it will spoil. But when you are ready, the teacher will come. When you are ready, the light will come. And if you're going through a bottoming out time in your life, I want you to know that that is a classic element in conversion. For example, you all know the story about the prodigal son, and he went through a bottoming out. He was journeying, and you know, he had his philosophy of partying, and you know, being the life of the party, and spending all the money, and having a good time. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That was his philosophy. That's a lot of people's philosophy. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. There is no more. There is nothing else. But then when he bottomed out, he had, as the Bible says, he came to his senses. He had an awakening. And he said, this isn't working. <laughs> it's like, hello, wake up. It's not working. Try something new. Why don't you go to an eternal philosophy? Why don't you go to a philosophy that works? A philosophy that's been tried and tested by millions of people. And it works. It brings resurrection. And of course, the philosophy I'm talking about is the illumination the rebirth, the resurrection that only Jesus Christ can bring. So if you're going through a dark time, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're lost. It means that God's working in your life, ready to bring you something more. As I said, the dark ages was followed by the Renaissance and then by the age of enlightenment in a dark room. It's always followed by a, a beautiful portrait. You know, when it comes to wine, it's always followed by maturity. Uh, a baby in, in darkness is always followed by a new birth. So I want you to have hope, a living hope. And that's exactly what happened in my life. Wow, did my life change. I'm no longer in darkness. I've come into, as it says in 1 Peter, I've come, come into God's marvelous light. There's been a new illumination. And then I think about the early church. You know, in the early church, there was a great persecution People were being killed. They tried to squash the early church in the Acts of the Apostles. Stephen, the deacon, was killed. And then it says, because of all the persecution, the early church was scattered. And I learned that in the seminary, that it was the persecution, the darkness, the hard times in the early church that led to the explosive growth of the early church. The way I like to picture it is, when I was a young person, we used to pick these dandelions and then you, you blow on it and all the seeds go flying. I don't know, in Massachusetts where I grew up, it used to look like snow. Seeds would be flying everywhere. And that's the way it, is, it was in the early church. It was Tertullian that said that the blood of martyrs was the seed of the church. I remember when I studied in Rome, there were all kinds of different churches dedicated to the martyrs. Lawrence and Agnes and Peter and Paul. And their blood, the persecution, the death of these early Christians led to the explosive growth of the church. The Catholic Church, the Christian Church, all over the world now, billions of people love Jesus. All because these seeds died and exploded and grew. And it's the same in our life too. The darkness that you go through, the hardships, the deaths that you go through, the bottoming out, the discouragement, the rejection, the addictions, the hard times aren't meant to defeat you. They are meant to develop you. And I want you to get that. It happened in the early church. It happened with Beethoven. It happened in the life of St. Paul of the Cross. It happened with me. It happens to babies when they're born. They go through darkness. It happens with wine in order for it to mature. It happens with photographs in order for it to develop. It happened in our culture from the Dark Ages to the Renaissance. And it happens with seeds. They must die in order to be scattered and to grow. And it happened with the mighty sequoia. That seed died and it exploded and became something new. Whatever you're going through, divorce, discouragement, rejection, feeling far from God, having a bottoming out, dealing with all kinds of hardships and sufferings physically. I want you to know that just as seeds sprout and have miraculous growth, just as wine matures, 
just as pictures develop, I want you to know that you can sprout and grow and become all that you can be as you believe Jesus' philosophy and give your life to him. Your darkness isn't meant to defeat you. It's meant to develop you. And one day, I believe if you listen to what I've just said, you will sprout and grow explosively and grow strong like the mighty Sequoia. I hope my sharing about Lent has been beneficial for you. I want you to have the most successful, significant Lent and life that you've ever had. I've got all kinds of resources. Talked a lot about change in Lent. My book, You Can Change, will really help you. I have a book all about intimacy with the Holy Spirit. I have a book called Rise that will help you to rise. I have a book called Challenges Make Champions. You can face the challenges in your life and be a champion. And I have books on just about every area, suffering, prayer, and books that will really help you. Now, my latest book to date, my 21st book, is called Windows of Wisdom. This book will help you to live with abundance, to know God's wisdom into the depths of your heart. When I read spiritual books, I, it's a prayer for me, and I sense the voice of God, and I know that the voice of God will come to you through these books. Please consider purchasing my resources. I also have DVDs and CDs. By the way, if you purchase all 21 books, half price. You purchase them together. It's a great deal. I want you to read these books and to benefit from them. Something interesting happens when I go to a personal appearance like in Baton Rouge or Orlando. People come out of the woodworks and they, they buy my resources. But on television, it's kind of only a trickle because I think people are afraid to call the number. We're not going to give your information to anybody. Strictly confidential. And I can guarantee you this, 100% of your money to buy these resources will go to the production and the airing of Live With Passion. Would you consider buying my resources? Please call that number right now. I know you're going to be glad that you did. Don't just live. Live with passion. Discover your purpose. Be energized. Realize your potential. Live God's will. Father Cedric's books, DVDs, and CDs will inspire you to live passionately. Make a move right now and purchase these inspiring resources. To order, simply call 844-FATHER-C. That's 844-328-4372. Write us at Father Cedric Ministries, 430 Bunker Hill Road, Houston, Texas, 77024. Or log on to www.fathercedric.org. That's www.frcedric. Org. Today is the day to make a change in your life and become all that you can be.